of it. Okay, um, well, good evening. Welcome to our event, Making Your Masters Work For You. Um, I'm going to hand over to um, Zoe now to introduce the session. Thanks, Alice. My name is Helen Lawton-Smith. I'm the director of the Centre for Innovation Management Research. We launched in 2008, and since then we've grown into an internationally recognised research centre focusing on themes relating to innovation management research, drawing on a range of disciplines, including economics, economic geography and management. The centre worked on two important issues. The first one is the cooperation between universities and industry. More and more universities are doing this cooperation. They should understand better what's the economic and social impact of this cooperation, which often goes beyond the simple contracts that industries grant to universities. The second is the importance to foster the European economic recovery through greater investment for innovation. And this can be done according to cooperative ventures, international, as the European Union has done for several years. Now there are new trends, even in the United Kingdom, for example, through the Francis Crick Institute. And it's very important to understand that this major investment has an important economic and social benefit. And I think the centre is playing a crucial role in order to convince policymakers and businessmen that our future is there. To our events, which include workshops, roundtables, seminars, we engage with a wide range of organisations, including commercial bodies, higher education institutions. And we use these events to disseminate the results of our research and engage in debates with broader audiences. What really uh, benefited me the most is that not just that I'm doing my research in isolation of what's going on, but, uh, the seminars that we're doing and the networking events, I get to see other academics and researchers and policy makers or uh, consultants in this area to see what's, what's going on in, in the world. Uh, because what we care about after all in our area is the how to commercialize that and uh, how to commercialize the innovation and entrepreneurship and how you can reflect on the policy making after all. Our research is regularly published in top quality journals. We also publish books and book chapters. We present at international conferences and get invited to speak in a variety of forums. <laughs> Welcome Carson Paul Arthur from the School of Law to deliver today's lecture. In a lecture marking Black History Month, Carson will be speaking. <laughs> Hello everyone, um, we're Mensu here from Carson. Um, my name is Doin um, Olorun Femi. I am part of the Center for Innovation Management and Research, and I am currently um, doing my PhD in entrepreneurship at Birkbank. I'm also a Birkbank alumna. And uh, today I have with me co-host, um, fellow Backpack alumna, Melina Piriachi. Um, Melina, do you want to say hi? Okay, she hi probably- Hi, everyone. <laughs> okay, so we get to meet Melina later. We get to meet Melina later. Melina is an innovation consultant and she's also the author of the book, The Innovator's Method, bringing new ideas to market. Today, Melina will be in, um, interviewing two innovation experts, Harry Data and Ian Cox. I'll leave Melina to do the intro introduction to them later. So let's start. I want to, first of all, start by thanking Professor Helen Lawton Smith, who is the director um, for. She's director of the Center for Innovation Management Research. And just want to say thank you to Helen for allowing us to do this event a second time under the uh, CIMR umbrella. 
when I was in when I was a Breckbeck student um, in the summer term, Helen was convening a model and she sent an email to the students as our lecturers do, asking us to come for a CRMR event. And I didn't know what it was about, but it sounded interesting. So I showed up and I have showed up for the CRMR event ever since then. And it has been instrumental to shaping my thoughts networking, meeting people in the industry, and understanding the academic and industry view for most things, um, entrepreneurship and innovation. And that's why Melina and I are very, very passionate about this event. You know, we want an opportunity to showcase what the center and what the School of BAI, the business school offers uh, as a whole to students. And you can decide to, you know, take as much as you want and also build your career, possibly shape your future uh, from what you learn. So we're gonna hear from two alumni as well, uh, alumni members, um, Leila, Kel and Alexander Mitchell as well later on in the last panel of the day. So please use the chat box because you might not be able to ask questions when the speakers are speaking or when the panels are going on, but we have left 15 minutes at the end to um, answer the questions that we will pick up from the chat box. I would also be sharing a link at the end for an evaluation because we want your feedback. We want to know the topics that you want us to feature in um, future events as well. Um, so without further ado, we're going to start the event with um, Dr. Luca Adriani. Um, Luca is a lecturer of economics here at Breckbeck, and in addition, he is a co-director for the Center of the Center for Political Economy and Institutional Studies. He's also the director of the MSc Business Political Economy. He recently founded the social media initiative Five Minutes, which he will talk about. He will talk to us about shortly. His research interests are on individuals' attitudes towards corruption, trust, and tax evasion, and how these attitudes influence the state citizens' relationship. Over to you, Luca. Okay, so can you hear me? Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. It's, uh, it's an honor here to, to be here, and uh, it's a very good opportunity to share uh, my things with uh, with the rest of the students and thanks Helen because she's got a very strong inclusive spirit so and in the inclusiveness of this spirit uh, has been uh, created this uh, social media initiative that you talked about which is for the five minutes if you want to uh, if you don't mind I can put on the chat line uh, the website for this initiative actually this started last summer uh thinking that uh, given that everything will be done remotely for a while then it was probably an opportunity to also disseminate a little bit of uh, chat and debate and debates on many different topics uh, debates on uh, public affairs debates on education uh, debates on economics about on business and innovation uh, uh, social and public life and so I thought, okay, why why not to create a sort of platform where it has to be inclusive, so we can discuss or I can interview people uh, in particular topics, but they need to be short, uh, and the the question is to be simple, and the answer needs to be simple because everyone needs to access these answers. So uh, I I organize uh, through the my the research center, Center for Political Economy and Institutional Studies, quite a few workshops, uh, quite technical because sometimes we invite people talking about their papers and uh, they're, they're really, really, usually the technical things that academics might like, that the rest of the people probably might be a little bit left aside. Uh, but this is a different initiative. So uh, if, you, if you click uh, on, the, um, on the link, uh, then you will see, for example, uh, uh, at least the three interviews, and there will be other interviews for coming in the next few weeks. Uh, the topics are is quite a large variety of topics. Uh, actually, the first one uh, is an interview to Dr. Federica Rossi, who is uh, one of the assistant director of um, 
of the CFMR, which is about uh, university industry collaboration. Uh, th these interviews are short, they are less than five minutes. Uh, they are usually based on three, four questions, very basic, and the answers is pretty much one minute each. Uh, the, the idea is that uh, is also involved the collaboration of different research centers. So Federica comes from the CMR. Uh, there will be other people uh, involving. I mean, there will be other people interview from other research centers in the in the university. But there are people coming from. Uh, the second interview comes from uh, is uh, um, to Anna Irfan from University of Oxford. Uh, there will be a forthcoming interview from a guy that uh, say works on uh, emotions and how emotions can affect economic behavior from the University of Bordeaux. Uh, will be next week. I just anticipating that. Uh, so these the, these the things, and uh, I'm very sorry. I'm very, very happy. If you want to know more about it, just feel free to contact me. Uh, I, um, I'm sure you, you can. Uh, I can give um, the my email address, uh, or if you if you want to know more about this initiative, please feel free to contact me. If somebody uh, has something to say and uh, he wants to be a guest, for example, uh, we can discuss about it. Uh, it's, uh, we have a quite um, good long list until January, February, but then there might be some some slot available. So, and as I said, very inclusive. Uh, I, I really like uh, there will be people from academia as well as people from outside. So it's uh, and 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 it doesn't have a specific specific topic. It's it's more about public affairs, but also innovations, but also uh, education as well. And uh, so I. I I really hope you will enjoy these episodes. These episodes then are broadcasted, uh, disseminated to our YouTube channels, and they are disseminated then through our Birbeck newsletter. And um, uh, it would be also great in case uh, the CMR wants to disseminate uh, the episode uh, through the CMR mailing list, because we do the same with the Center for Political Economy and Institutional Studies mailing list. In case, uh, in case I'm very happy that every time we update uh, uh, all the students and the CMR stakeholders about it. Um, except for this one, I think uh, is a is a brief presentation, but I really hope that it gives a, a quite clear uh, framework. If you have any questions, please feel free to. Uh, to ask because uh, I I send you I give you my apologies to to everyone because I have to leave uh, in five six minutes because I got another appointment that I couldn't postpone unfortunately uh, because it seems a very very interesting workshop here but this is an example and then I stop talking and then I'm happy to receive questions this is an example of uh, uh, which kind of initiatives and many other types of initiatives of these things uh, the, the the school of business can can help in doing it because uh, since I started, I, when I proposed this initiative to the dean, uh, essentially I had discussed also this initiative with uh, with other colleagues. Essentially, the dean was super keen. I was like, okay, yes, great, do it. They gave me then a video editor and they gave me also a person that disseminated the information, so a communication officer. So they they were very keen, and uh, I I like it because here. Uh, Essentially, at Birbeck and especially in the School of Business, uh, there is support if somebody has got such a type of initiatives or other types of initiatives. And, uh, and I have to say that there is lots of collaboration across research centers. So uh, we, we already, with the CMR and the CPI, is my research center, we've already arranged a couple of workshops in the past. Uh, it's, it's very easy to do. So as, uh, as Dean said at the beginning, it's not that you have to follow everything, but we give resources and it's up to you to select what you like and what you don't or what you feel that it's, it's more interesting, what you what you feel that it fits more your taste. And I stop here and I'm happy to receive questions in case uh, of any questions. And in case you want to ask me a question now, you can also send me an email and uh, I will be very happy to reply to your emails. Uh, I'm done. Thank you so much. Thank you, Luca. That was really interesting. Uh, I saw the five minutes with uh, Dr. Federica Rossi, and I thought that was really interesting. 
uh, it sort of conveyed the gist of her research uh, in a very uh, short period of time and um, <clears throat> in a very simple language as well. Uh, so this, um, if you have any questions for, um, for Luca, any question for Luca? Um, I also put in the chat my email address in case. Okay, great. Yes, uh, mask uh, is is in the chat. Uh, uh, I I don't know if whether you uh, you can disseminate yeah. this email address among all the participants. Very happy to reply to any question. Yeah, very good. It's in the chat now. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Luca. Um, so this brings us to our first panel. Okay. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, well, thank to all of you and thank you so much for inviting me. Thanks. Pleasure, Luca. So today um, we are very pleased and excited to welcome two special guests. So we have uh, Pari Data from Cambridge Design Partnership and Ian Cox from Innovate UK. Uh, they have kindly agreed to share their experiences with us and to give us an insight into their innovation world. So Parry is a senior innovation professional who specializes in identifying, building, and validating new opportunities for major global companies and startups. He has 12 years of experience of leading innovation and strategy projects for many of the world's largest medical and pharmaceutical companies. Uh, Ian is uh, the innovation lead for the Agritech Centers at Innovate UK. Uh, Ian is leading the 100 million pounds program and developing the four centers for agricultural innovation as part of the UK's strategy for agricultural technologies. So welcome, Harry and Ian. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much for be being with us today. It's a real honor to have you here. Uh, I know how busy you are, and uh, we really appreciate that you're taking the time to speak with us today. So um, I have a few questions which I think will be relevant to the students, but there will be a Q&A at the end. So students will have the opportunity of asking their questions as well. So my first question to you both is, uh, how would you describe your role? What would a typical day look like? Uh, would you like to start, Ian? OK, certainly, <laughs> um, Lena. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, my role, it's an interesting <laughs> one uh, at Innovate UK. Uh, we are very much the UK government strategic innovation agency. Uh, and my role is uh, making sure that the four agri-tech centres that I look after um, are delivering on what they say they're supposed to be doing according to their uh, business plans, uh, spending their grant uh, as they're supposed to. Uh, we give them a core grant every year to engage with industry and academics um, where appropriate. Uh, so making sure they're doing what they're supposed to be doing uh, linking them up to appropriate government departments uh, for the policy agenda to see where they can interact on that side and um, also making sure that the four centres actually engage and work with each other as well so it's quite an interesting role um, on that side I need a very big feather duster to be able to sort of tickle them and get them to do things um, <laughs> I can't actually tell them what to do because that's classified as too much uh, government interference so I have to so it's a very interesting role. So no two days are the same, is all I can really sort of say. Um, yeah, typical day. There is no such thing as a typical day on that front. Today, I was in a board meeting of one of the centres, uh, and that went on till about three o'clock this afternoon. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, all the boring stuff, like sort of going through the finances, uh, but it's vitally important to make sure that we know what position they're in and how well they're coping in the situation we got with COVID. Um, and then also making sure they're complying with all the government <coughs> around that. And then after that, this afternoon, I had a conversation with uh, our contracts department to talk about some amendments to some grant funding agreements uh, before I came on the call like that. 
tomorrow i've got some calls talking with a chief technology officer head of finance um and the agri tech centers i have a sort of regular catch up with them with the chief exec so there's a quite a variety of what goes off really in my role no two days are the same and in between it as well I try and get in as much training uh what during the uh, wherever i can okay great thank you uh how about you parry um, so I agree with Ian. I mean, every uh, in innovation, no two days are the same. Um, so, so my role, I, I'm a senior innovation consultant. I, I'm an innovation leader for my company, Cambridge Design Partnership, which is essentially a consultancy that works for major global clients. So my role is all about finding the next set of growth opportunities for my clients. So that could be from an unmet need in the market, change in the competitive dynamics, could be a new technology that's come through that's, that's really exciting. These are all the things that can inspire new growth opportunities. So I'm always trying to discover these for my clients to assess whether these are opportunities. And then I work with them to devise strategies for them to address these opportunities. Is there an M&A process they need to merge in? Or it might be that they need to license a technology. Or it could be developing product concepts, which engineering and science teams then translate into products that come out to the market. And um, it's a real privilege to work with some of these brands. I'm working with uh, leading medical device companies on things related to the COVID diagnostics, for example. This is a real thing that's on the fire at the moment. Or it could be um, looking at, for example, the, the next generation of consumer health uh, technology. So there's lots of very, very, very things I'm working on. Um, so in terms of my actual day, like Ian, every single day is very different. I can tell you what today was like, but it will not be like tomorrow. Um, so today I was spending some time with my, uh, so as you get a bit more senior, you end up doing more reviewing, as you can imagine. Um, I don't do much user research myself, but my colleagues have been doing some really excellent research with the consumers, and they have literally hundreds of data points, and we're trying to find the patterns that can lead to an unusual new, new opportunity. So that's deep analysis. And in the, in the afternoon, I was talking to a client on a new potential project. I'm trying to find out what is the thing that's scaring them in the market. You know, we're reacting to a challenge in the market. I'm really trying to get under the skin of that challenge and work, work out what that means to them before working out how to help them. And then, and finally, one of the biggest challenges for us is when you have all of this data and all of this insight, how do we translate into something that's easy to understand, easy to follow? So I'm trying to boil down literally six months of research into 10 slides that I can best, uh, basically pitch to investors to say, this is the opportunity for your business. So that's, that's my day today. Very interesting. <laughs> Thank you. So your respective roles are quite different. Uh, yeah. Parry. Uh, what are the key skills that you need in your role? So in, in my role, I think there are several things. Analysis, analytical skills, being able to find um, the patterns in deep amounts of research. It's being an mm -hmm. internal student because innovation, never ch you have to keep learning. Everything changes every day. You'll uncover new insights in what you already know. So you have to be an internal student. You have to be empathetic. You need to understand the customers in the market, but you also need to understand your clients and the stakeholders. You have to be a strategic thinker because you've got to find the bigger picture and translate insight into what does this actually mean for a business? What does it mean for innovation? The, the cliche is creative. You have to be a creative thinker and think of what, and make connections that are sometimes difficult to, to make. But I think that overall, the most important thing is being able to communicate what you do in a way that the market and your peers understand. Communication is a very key skill to an innovator. Okay, thank you. And how about you, Ian? What are the key okay. skills? That um, some of what Perry's actually said as well. I mean, um, out there, sort of doing the analysis bit and being empathetic are very key. Uh, I would sort of phrase it a bit differently. I mean, I need a lot of determination in my role to actually sort of um, not necessarily accept the first answer that comes out there from people. Uh, along the way and to get things done uh, we do have to work to a lot of deadlines out there that's something you do need to be aware of it doesn't disappear once you finish your uh, degree course like that it's the ability to ask questions even what might be seen as a dumb question and not being afraid or embarrassed by doing that uh, because by challenging people's thoughts and assumptions you can actually get to the bottom of what uh, what it is they're trying to do uh, and uncover the reasons behind it all out there. Uh, being an influencer, I can't, in my role, I can't sort of dictate to the agri tech centres what they can do. We've got four individual boards out there with chief, strong chief executives, but I've got to sort of 
influence the direction of travel and uh, make suggestions and uh, coerce, move them on in the right direction I need to do. So that's I've got from, uh, influencing skills. I need to be financially astute. I need to um, be legally aware. Out there, so they're all boring bits, but they're vitally important about what you need to do. And I've got to be a fast learner as well. I've got to learn about a variety of different things, such as state aid, uh, something that we've got with the European Union. It's still going to apply after um, January the first in the new year. Um, we've got to work out what the new, what's going to, what the new uh, state aid regulations are going to be, and how that's going to impact on the centres. And it, also, that strategic piece out there is vitally important as well. Being able to take the helicopter view, looking at what's happening and what uh, what's going to happen over the next five years, and where um, try and direct, make sure the centres are aware of uh, thoughts of what's coming along and the railway line for them to go after and pursue. Okay, thank you. And Ian, do you think that those skills will evolve in the future? Yep, uh, very much so. As I sort of said, state aid, I'm going to have to become aware with yet another variation on uh, the state aid legal frameworks on that side. The strategy evolution is ongoing. Uh, I've started work with the agri-tech centres to look at building logic models so we can work out better ways to measure their performance. Um, one thing having a set of management metrics that can sort of work out how well they're doing currently but uh, to get continued funding for the agri-tech centres and agri-food in particular the government at the moment we need to be able to demonstrate impact so we've got to be able to demonstrate for every pound that's spent through the agri-tech centres it's going to return several pounds to uh, UK PLC if you like uh, mm -hmm. because the government gets paid through taxes and VAT and other things so we need to have sort of several pounds return on the investment on that. So it's it's about developing this these sort of new models. So that's forcing myself to have a quite a bit of think about what the purpose of the centres is. So that's evolving these skills, um, the strategy, and engaging much more with the uh, different government departments and trying to work out where the centres are going to be on the world stage because we do certainly in my area there there is a uh, we are sort of seen as global leaders. Uh, in terms of agricultural technologies and also trying to look at yeah where we think the future opportunities are going to be overall okay <clears throat> thank you and uh, parry uh, in your world how do you think that the skills will evolve in the future so there's i personally think that you know the core skills aren't going to change but the environment is going to change now it's a bit of an industry cliche for sure, but data and digital is, is so important. I mean, every innovation role you'll see advertised will say, do you understand digital? You know, do you understand how data results in new business models? So I think students need to understand that emerging area of data science and become comfortable in that area. Not experts perhaps, but understand it. And I think that's going to be paramount. Um, the other two things that I think I'm seeing more of is a more of an interest in business models. So I think innovation uh, students and innovation managers have traditionally been focused on the sort of side of the user need and, and trying to come up for solutions for that but actually more and more people are asking for interesting business models and an understanding of finances and the final thing that I think is going to change because of the environment we live in everything is going to change so trends are going towards who knows where it, you know if you asked me where the world was going a year ago it'd be very different to where the world is going tomorrow we don't know so we have 10 years pandemic and sort of the global political situation has changed the way that all these markets are going to play out. So I think understanding trends and being able to cope with uncertainty is going to become more and more important. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And uh, Parry, uh, what are the main challenges that you experience in your role? So I think that the, the two key challenges are, one of, the, one of the main challenges for me is that it's always about communication. It's not the work you do, it's how you communicate that. And the reason why I say that is the most important thing is not just communicating it, but understanding the people you're reporting to, you're talking to. So when I'm doing a client engagement, I really need to get under the skin of what's driving, what's happening. So understanding people and communicating to answer their needs is always going to be important. And that's really challenging because every person is different, every company is different, every stakeholder is different. If I'm presenting to a Technical audience, I have to talk about uh, electrons and molecules. 
and then you know they're not so bothered about the the market need and i'm talking to an investor they're working talking about the dollars etc so i have to be agile and react to the people i'm talking to and i think that's the biggest challenge different markets of different stakeholders and sort of the variety that innovation can provide innovation is fun because it's so full of variety but it's also challenging because of that variety okay thank you and how about you ian Okay, slightly different. I agree with everything Parry sort of said on that. I mean, the ability, as he sort of said, innovation's uh, fun. It's good because you can sort of be very nosy and stick your nose in and sort of see what's lift the lid on various things and see what uh, what's out there. And uh, you need a good open inquiring mind. Um, in terms of my role, really, the biggest challenges I face are uh, lack of funding. Uh, we mm -hmm. run, uh, we run a lot of competitions for innovators and things like that. Um, we do get a few tough um, requests through where people haven't answered the questions, but when you look, we could fund our competitions five or six times over with the number of quality applications we get. So it is, we have to be very brutal in terms of what we fund, and it's um, quite hard to do that, really, um, okay. uh, to actually sort of look at uh, what, you've, what you're actually funding there. Time is another big thing that's a big challenge out there. We never have enough time in the day to look at everything and uh, do all that we need to do. So I very much have to sort of prioritise and uh, be quite ruthless about what we're going to get done. Um, and sort of, yeah, government as well, we have a lot of problems with policy cycles. For instance, we're supposed to be having a three-year planning review, mm -hmm. our one-year deal, which is great. <laughs> Just make the continuity and long term the longevity of the centers and some of the projects they want to do difficult um, because they're in the middle of a funding cycle at the moment and uh, they, they technically run out of grant on March the 31st, but uh, they've got sort of three, four year projects are in the middle of what happens on that. So it's all this uncertainty and doubt that we get yeah. through government funding cycles along the way. So it's a different Different world to live in like that to uh, Paris in some respects. <laughs> Different ends of the, the spectrum. It is really, yeah, very much so. Okay, thank you. So we are currently in the middle of a crisis and uh, presumably uh, there will be some uh, form of impact on innovation. So in your experience, what are the challenges of innovating in a crisis? So for me? Um, yes. So I think in a crisis, basically the rules change completely. So you know you'll have done all this research into what the market wants last year. Now that's completely relevant. So a company was trying to launch a premium beverage, um, for example, on their roadmap this year. That's their plan. That's out the window. Suddenly you have to generate a completely new roadmap. You just need to set a product. You've got no time to do that in. You've got, got to have new products out within two or three doors, two or three years. On top of that, you're facing a crushing loss of revenue. So, you know, you're not, no longer generating money. So you have to come up with innovations rapidly mm -hmm. and you have to do it at a low, with low, less investment than ever before. So the, these are huge challenges. And then you have to make very difficult decisions on what to take forward and what not to take forward. So some of my clients have had to, you know, act projects which you know have been on the board for five to 10 years that could be potentially revolutionary. I take on some more incremental projects which are, can lead to products, but certainly not game changes. So I guess the, the, the problem in a crisis is uncertainty and being able to deal with it. Making tough decisions becomes really important. But whenever you make a tough decision, it must never be on gut. It always has to be based on evidence. And so generating that evidence in short times for less money uh, with huge risks is very challenging. But, you know, crises are not things to be feared. They create new opportunities. Problems create opportunities. And I think that's how people should uh, are seeing it in many ways. Yeah. And I how agree. about you, Ian? Yeah, I agree with what Parry's saying there. I mean, uh, when you look uh, back through the history of the 20th century, sort of uh, crises and uh, wars have actually sort of led to a hell of a lot of innovations which we take for granted now. Uh, out there and modern techniques and technologies, uh, after as it may seem, sort of a crisis actually does help uh, because when you're faced with a lack of funding, as mm -hmm. a lot of countries are, they're not sure what's going to happen. They have to sort of be innovative and come up with different ways of doing things. Um, even Innovate UK, uh, we have a traditional sort of um, sort of normal funding cycle. Yet earlier this year, we were facing uh, when 
cope when the lockdown started. We didn't know what the hell to do. Uh, but we, somebody came up with a great idea that uh, we should actually start helping to try and bail out a lot of small companies, mm -hmm. small sized companies, try and do something innovative to cope with COVID. How could they adapt their businesses? How could they help communities to deliver solutions to problems they got in their local region? So we very quickly got a, a competition running in about two to three weeks. Normal innovate time cycle for that is six months plus with all the bureaucracy that goes with it. And we shortened down the list of questions we normally ask people from 10 to 4 questions. And we got swamped with a number of applications we got from, from a huge number of companies that we don't deal with normally. And uh, we ended up funding 6,000 companies up to £50,000 per company. Uh, which we've never done before. So actually, we were forced to, through the crisis to adopt a different way of working. Now that now the sort of the um, viewing it off the back of the milk float, if you like the hindsight, it's starting. People go, "Why did you do it this way? And why did you do all that? You know, and you didn't do all of this procedure." And that's what happens afterwards. But at the time, we we were able to help a heck of a lot of companies stay in business and develop new solutions. Some of which are actually it's great because you can actually see the fruit of your labor coming to market very quickly. You had to deliver within six months. And you can have, we're actually now sort of seeing some of these coming through and it's brilliant. That was a real buzz from my side. So yeah, getting that funding, it's key. <laughs> and working and getting beautiful partners to work with as well is also key as well. Not easy, not easy in a crisis. <laughs> you used innovation as a strategy to to face the crisis. <laughs> oh, hey, somebody sent her a thing. He said, Good job, <laughs> 6,000, thanks. <laughs> My pleasure. Um, I, 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 we had to do the job in a weekend, uh, was actually review, reviewing 58 proposals. Uh, and we were given scoring criteria to, to award the marks against. And uh, some of them were really, you really felt for the some of these people going through it along the way so i'm glad to hear that that uh somebody was able to benefit from our work on that <laughs> it was it's that's really good to hear on that so thank you <laughs> so uh what advice would you both give to the students so uh ian don't stop learning once you finish your course mm -hmm. uh you're gonna be like this this old cliche saying about lifelong learning it's true you're always going to be learning new things um, all the time. Uh, so sort of keep, keep learning, attending courses, try something different. Um, and if you've got an idea that you want to innovate with, um, go and test that concept. Try and think of it from the sort of customer's viewpoint or your potential market to try and see so what's in it for me? Why should I want to buy this new technology that's coming on the market? What is it going to do? How is it going to make my life easier? Um, because certainly you find that uh, we get inundated with all sorts of IT bits and technology at the moment. But the reality is if it's not easy to use, it's not going to make your life easier. People won't want it. even if It's the best thing since, since sliced bread. Uh, so always try and if you've got when you're developing new ideas, try and think about the end customer. Uh, why would they want to do it? Um, also, recognise that you're going to have to learn things like finance and the legal aspects. Um, if you're working in collaboration as well, be prepared to work with other people and have to sort of share your ideas. And there are things like um, I pick the sort of collaboration agreements, uh, which we encourage people to use on those fronts that are freely available. Uh, so think about all that sort of side of it. Work out how you're going to sort of develop your idea, produce, um, if you're going to make something, how you're going to produce it, who, the staffing you're going to need to deliver on it, the marketing, and also um, what's your end game from whatever you want to innovate? Do you want to sort of become the next Bill Gates and a multi-billionaire, or do you want to actually sort of recognise that your skill is sort of in the early stage innovation and sort of then you need an end game to get out of sort of capitalise on your investment? So there's things like that. Sort of have, try and have a plan, uh, work it through on that front. OK, thank you. How about you, Barry? I echoed many of the things that Ian was saying. I think you have to be an eternal student. Keep on stu mm -hmm. studying after you've finished 
studying effectively. And I think in this age where people don't have careers where they're in a company for 30, 40 years, and you may have a portfolio career where you have three, four, four different yeah. positions. So keep learning. Uh, network, I think that's a really important thing to build, your network, all the people you speak to. Take advantage of LinkedIn, talk to lots of different people. Build that network, because innovation comes from making those connections. So peeking to peeking people in different fields is always very useful. Have an inquiring mind, quite inquiring mind, question all the time. Never take make assumptions, break the assumptions when you're thinking about uh, new ideas. Like Ian said, the user need is the most important thing. Without that, you have innovate, no innovation. Innovation is all about gener generating value for someone, so understand the user really intricately. Um, so all of these things that I think are, are very important uh, to take forward. Okay, thank you. Finally, one last question, very briefly, because we've um, run out of time. Uh, are there any theories, concepts, or um, ha that have shaped your thinking uh, when it comes to innovation? Um, so there, there are many different theories and concepts. I mean, one of the things about being in innovation, being an eternal learner, learner is I spent, I've read so many books and theories, and there are many that I love. I love the jobs to be done theory, right? Everyone knows that. Innovation, you know, people hire the tools to get a job done. Uh, you know, I also respect the work of strategic people like Michael Porter and Clayton Christensen. It's good to learn all the theories that these guys have. And then the creative minds like uh, Altshuler, who created Triz, just follow all the theories and different models. You can learn a lot from them. But one thing you do, do get in the end is that they're all trying to basically saying very similar things, and you get a general sense for what is good when you're trying to create an innovation. Yeah. Okay. How about you, yeah. Ian? Yeah, I agree with Harry on that. Sort of try and um, look as many different theories and concepts as you possibly can. But Porter's very good for his strategic uh, <laughs> uh, on that side. I'm going to plug another um, management guru, Tom Peters, who wrote In Search of Excellence. Great book uh, coming up with theories like managing by walking about um, and the plant. And uh, he sort of said, ready, fire, aim is a good one out there um i see that with one of my chief executives he's sort of uh really fires from the hip sort of trying different ideas all the time i have another one who likes to plan 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 and almost forgets to take the shot at the end like that <laughs> different approaches along the way and uh you look at the success rate um a bit about sort of ready fire aim uh actually deliver the goods more often than you would believe uh on that side so it's an interesting interesting approach like that so go out read as many different um read upon as many different people as you possibly can um go on as many courses and webinars that are out there at the moment there's an awful lot happening um and universities have got all sorts of uh nukes online and that so learn learn what you can from all sorts of different angles but yeah recommending search of excellence it's an old book 1980s but a lot of what they say is still valid today and if you go on tompeters.com, you can actually download his entire slide presentation of what he's done for about the last 30 years. So all his late, all his research. So it's quite a good place to go and find out a variety of things on that front. All right, uh, great. Six interesting hats by um, De Bono. Yeah, absolutely. Hey. Brilliant book. Very, very good. The bit I like in that is uh, the bit about passing the red ball around the mm -hmm. table. To actually sort of say only the person with the red ball in the hand can speak when you've got oh, yes. group, when you've got a group and uh, try and limit it to 30 seconds to a minute at a time like that to stop any one person hogging the whole conversation so you can actually pass it around the group it's a good way to uh, encourage um this proper open discussion amongst people all right thank you very much well unfortunately we've reached the end of our session Thank you so much again, Parry and Jan, for being with us today. It's been a real pleasure to speak with you. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, there will be a QA and a at the end. So mm -hmm. there will most probably be a few more questions for you. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you again. Uh, now I would like to invite uh, Helen Lawton-Smith, a professor of entrepreneurship and director of the CIMO, to tell us a bit more about the CIMO. Okay, well, th thank you uh, both for a fantastic session. Um, Ian and Parry, that was great. I'm going to pick up on uh, 
three things that you said in the way of introducing the CAMR, and I think Doreen is going to put the uh, web page up for the CAMR. Can we do that? Here we go. Thank you. So, um, don't stop learning. Having a little bit. Um, when you finish a course, be an eternal student and networking. So the Centre of Innovation Management Research was introduced on the video and, uh, and by Doyen, which was terrific. So you've got a, a flavour of, of that. So when you're a current student, I recognise some of the names of the participants from last summer's module uh, entrepreneurship and innovation and some of the bio business students and you, you've attended events so it's obviously worth you sticking with us because we are doing lots of exciting things so one of the things we're, we're running this term as well as last term is the CMIR debates in public policy and what these are they're an hour event at lunchtime and the idea is that we set up an interesting topic for debate. So whether it's about China's technological advances, about the welfare state and disabled entrepreneurship. And we've got two in November on entrepreneurship policy and research agenda. And then one in December on technology transformation for public good. And so the last two are given by two of our practitioner policymakers. So John Potter from the OECD, is giving the one on November the 18th, and the one on December the 19th is our colleague from the from the Cabinet Office. So what you get from us is an international community of scholars, practitioners, policymakers that regularly organise our events and attend our events. So that's the public policy debates, and there's one one tomorrow. Uh, what we also uh, can bring you to you as eternal students is research on topical events. So you can see the one about China that Klaus Nielsen um, gave as his talk uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, the Bloomsbury Festival, again, it was about the problems on the innovating in a digital technology in a time of crisis. I've been doing mm -hmm. some work with Innovate UK on inclusivity and diversity challenges in business innovation. And if we can go down a little bit more on uh, on this and see see what else we're doing. But the general point is that there is lots of things that you can be participating in and even leading from last term comments in one of the lectures led to a new CIMR event. So the only advantage I can see of in of the pandemic is that it's made us go online as already been referenced by Ian and Parry that you can do things much more quickly than you could before so we put on a, on a new event so if you stay with us uh, as alumni you can be involved in organizing events like Melina and Doyen you can join us as a PhD student like like uh, Doyen we can help you with your publication if you do uh, a very good dissertation as you are doing there's a possibility of doing a blog and putting that on the website turning it into a um, working paper and maybe even getting um, a paper published as what's as was the case with a student from, from the, a year ago she's got a paper being published so we have ways of involving you helping you with your careers and you to uh, lots of our events and perhaps we can go to the alumni page, Doyen. Can we look at the alumni page and see what, who we are on the people page? Okay, so if we go to the alumni. Okay, so we've got a whole range of people from who are in different parts of the world now. And so it's an opportunity for you to engage with people. There are the uh, details about their dissertations. So Abir uh, was one of my students some years ago. But everybody keeps in touch. And this is Gillian, whose paper has just been published. So we are trying to find ways of engaging with you in this awful time by giving the opportunity to uh, take part in our activities as a current student and when, when you leave us and stay on with us. Um, as eternal students as part of our 
alumni community. So I think I'm going to stop there because I think I've said what I want to say about CAMR, but you can email me at, at, at any point. Uh, you can get in touch with uh, Melina and, and Doyen. And I have a great team working with us. So Federica has joined us as Deputy Director and, and Marion Pence is the other Deputy Director. But we have people that are doing lots of activities for it. So it is a very much a, an engaged community. I'll stop there then. Thank you, Doyen. Thank you, Melina, for organizing this. Thank you so much, Helen, for that. And uh, students, there are lots and lots that you can benefit from. I have just pasted on the chat the next CIMR event, which is tomorrow. Um, you can still register up until the end of the day today. And you'll be sent the joining um, instructions once you do that. So it's in the chat. And um, it's going to be Helen discussing her paper on welfare state, um, a facilitator or inhibitor of inclusive entrepreneurship. So please do join us for that event. OK, so. Um, um, so we have here the alumni panel and thank you so much, Ian and Parry. That was so insightful. And I, I wrote so many, so many um, tips down that you have shared with us. Um, so we're going to move now to the alumni section and the alumni panel. Like we said, this is um, the CIMR alumni event, and it's showcasing what the CIMR offers us as students. Um, today, we have titled this one, Making Your MSc Work For You. And so we're going to be calling up um, Alexander Mitchell, and uh, we also have Leila Kell, uh, who will be joining me in the interview and we'll hear from them. Hi, guys. Hi, Alexander. Hi, Leila. Hi, how are Hello you? Hello there. Thank you for inviting us, Georgine. Yes, and we'll drag Leila. Leila is way back in the, in the US. So <laughs> I was kind of hoping, I said, I hope Leila calculated the time OK, and she's going to be here at the right time. So I guess the best place to start will be to get you to Introduce yourself, like what did you do prior to Backpack? What did you study? What year did you finish? And what do you currently do? So I'll ask four questions in one there. So we'll start ladies first. We'll start with you, Leila. Thank you, Georgian. Um, so I finished my, my master's degree officially in 2018. So that's when my graduation took place. Um, and I originally started my career in Germany with a co-op degree in wholesale and foreign trade, working at the River Group. Um, it's a big retailer. And one of the departments that I found really interesting was dedicated to innovation and promotion activities, which is far, partly where I found the inspiration for innovation. But the one part I really wanted to understand what motivates people um, to take their idea and then build a company out of it. And that's when I decided, OK, I want to like, like learn more about that topic. And I decided to study innovation management and entrepreneurship at Birkbeck, which was a great experience. But I think we're going to dive into that a little later. Um, so right now, work wise, I work at Plug and Play Tech Center. We are an innovation ecosystem headquartered in Silicon Valley. And in my team, we partner with government organizations around the world to promote their initiative and to support their startups to grow globally. My personal role involves managing the three month acceleration program dedicated to those international entrepreneurs. And in, in addition, I help to establish those partnerships together um, with the government organizations. Thanks, Leila. And you, Alex? Hi, so yeah, I'm I'm Alexander Mitchell. I'm the CEO of a company called Blind Cupid. So I uh, literally just finished my master's degree not that long ago at Birkbeck. Um, just submitted my dissertation, I think, a couple of weeks ago. And, uh, well done. Yeah, very, yeah, very, very recent. Uh, so I used to be a lawyer previously, um, but I always wanted to be an entrepreneur and I always had this uh, great idea. Uh, I was always obsessed with uh, human beings and how to really understand them the best using technology and uh, a few other things. And um, when I, you know, I used to work in the city and I was always 
staring out my window daydreaming about the you know creating this company which i now have done and i never really knew how to do it uh and so i you know the beauty about Birkbeck is you can work at the same time, you can have that career change. And quite literally, that's what I did. So I, I enrolled at Birkbeck while still working in the city. And after, I, did, I think, two or three months of, um, of doing this master's degree, which was all really to teach me about how to create a company and to meet people that I might bring onto my team, which I did do from Birkbeck, I actually quit my job and then went right head first into the company, which to be honest, is the best decision I've ever made. Um, and I, I guess I can tell you more about that tonight. But yeah, so I used to be a lawyer, had big ambitions to be an entrepreneur, wasn't entirely sure how to do it, did this course, and now I'm absolutely loving my life. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. Thanks, guys. That That's amazing. And, you know, just like you, I, I know that feeling of working. I know the doing that walks into the orientation and the doing that came out at the end, completely different. And I want us to kind of like unpack that metamorphosis. So what happened? How, how did the change happen? And tell us your back, back story. Um, should we start with you, Alex? Sure. So um, how did that change happen? So I, I you know, like I say, I had a pretty well developed mm -hmm. ideas to what I wanted to do as a business. Um, but I didn't really know how to practically bring it about. So there are a few modules I did at Birkbeck, which really helped me, uh, you know, from the first one, um, entrepreneurial venture creation, where we write a business plan and so on. That was just amazing. And it was really the foundation of everything, uh, writing that business plan, critiquing your own idea, basically seeing if it is commercially viable. So moving away from the theory, oh, this is a cool idea, let's do this, actually focusing on can it work? If so, what do I have to do? Doing all of the analysis. And that's when it makes it really more real. And so I think, um, yeah, just being surrounded with people at Birkbeck, um, other students who either they already have an idea and they're already working on it or they have, you know, the they have like the infancy of an idea but but also i think you know huge credit has to go to the faculty who are very much amazing and i think that you know a lot of the times when you, you think about business you might think you know is academia really something which i should focus on not too practically focused you know there's a lot of skepticism there but you know based on my experience it's really it's worth it like this is this is a discipline that is actually worth going to university to do and uh, you know i was in the commercial world i was working in the city i uh, I could have easily just thought, oh, I'm going to read books about entrepreneurship instead of doing this master's. And if I had done that, I wouldn't have been anywhere near as successful as I am now. So it's a, it, it's a, it's a very good course, seriously. It's, it has both the academic stuff you would want to know and is really fun, uh, but also is very practically focused. So this, this is like the best of both worlds. So I, the change that I experienced in my year at Birkbeck, because I, I did it full time in one year, um, it's, yeah, it's been significant. And uh, like I say, it's the, one of the best decisions I made. Well done, Alex. Uh, Leila, what's your backpack story? I first, I can second what Mitchell just said. Like the people that come together at Birkbeck are very, very special. And that was also my experience because you don't really find that student who just wants to have a degree. Everyone has a story. And I think that's partly because we Birkbeck is an evening <laughs> university and people come there because they want to have a change in their life. They maybe already are working in their current job, but, but they want to do something differently. And I think that creates a very special dynamic and energy at the mm -hmm. university campus. And I also experienced the great support from the, from the CAMR team. Federica was actually my supervisor and she really guided me through the whole process um, of writing the thesis up to doing a, a publication in the end. And it's thanks to her that I got introduced in the end to Henry Atzkowitz, who has also done some significant research in the innovation space with the triple helix model, because he is he was uh, at, located at Stanford and he was one of my first contacts here in the US. And um, yeah, so that was one of the connections that helped me to get started here when I literally <laughs> knew nobody um, moving moving to Silicon Valley. And from from the CIMR research, um, I started to bridge my kind of gap time when I was waiting for my work permission. And from there, I could, with, with that experience, it also helped me to apply for the job I'm currently in. Um, yeah, so, and then of course, there were also some modules, I can second that, that are really important. 
um, and were really important to me. So, for example, the model of open innovation like that we learned right in the beginning, that's actually our company motto, motto at Plug and Play. They say that innovation should, should be open to anyone and everywhere, um, which is so important to understand. And we, we have to always um, keep in mind that there are smart people and great ideas all over the world. It's just a question if we can bring the innovation capabilities and resources to those places as well. And that's something that really inspires me and that I keep until today. And then second, the systems of innovation, which is something that um, also Mr. Cox, Ian mentioned and Pari mentioned in the, in the talk, is that there are so many stakeholders coming together. And you have to understand that it's a network. Networking is so crucial in the 21st century. And also in our innovation ecosystem, we bring together the governments, we bring together uh, with, with the corporates, with the startups, with the investors. And that's why it works. Because in the end, what's really, <laughs> what we really have to understand, like the world has become so complex that one person we cannot know everything. So we need to create a system where we can create, uh, share that knowledge and where we can share resources together. So I think these were some of the courses that were really inspiring and drawing from there also the concepts of co-creation and co-development. And we see it in examples today. For example, the Lego co-creation model where the customers actually become the innovators or the co-opetition in the Corona app that we see this year between Apple and Google, the, the main big competitors. I think this is really, you can see the innovation concepts in life today. Thanks, Leila. So you've already gone into it because I was going to say, if I shouted the words star model, um, what will it be? And you seem to have cited your dissertation, which led to your publication. You've also, you also mentioned the, I think that was Odile's model, innovation management and policy. And you seem to mention the network, innovation networks as well. I think that was taught by Klaus. Um, I know this because <laughs> like you, I think we did the same, um, the same course. So, Mr. Alexander, what were your own star models? Was there any model that did it for you that you can pinpoint to that was where it all changed? Sure, I think um, there's got to be two. Um, so one is entrepreneurial venture creation, which I mentioned earlier, and the other, uh, like Leila was saying, uh, this yeah. um, I think that, you know, going with the first one, you know, you approach it when you just have an idea and you have to really see its commercial viability and you really, you, we all were given mentors and, and actually my mentor, Stephen, is uh, now one, he works in my company. So he wow. went mentoring me to be part of my company. He's another commercial director. So I think, to be honest, that just shows that this degree, unlike maybe the perception of degrees in general, this is very hands-on. Where like you're going to be working with people, studying with people that literally might get involved in creating something which millions of people might use and buy and consume. So it's a very, um, it's a very hands-on degree. And, um, I definitely think that entrepreneurial venture creation was the biggest. Uh, it was the first module, one of the first modules we did. It was, uh, it, it was the funnest. Uh, they were all fun, but it was the funnest and the most, uh, the most. Uh, I think. Uh, it brought about the biggest change and the biggest acceleration towards uh, what I ultimately ended up doing. And then uh, the other, I can't remember the module title, but when we were studying open innovation and social innovation, and, and that was very, like I was saying earlier, it, it was academic, but also very practical focused as well. Um, because you could really, we started to delve into, you know, what actually is innovation? What are the conditions for it to work? And, um, and so on, because we, we're all familiar with the term innovation, but you know, seldom do people actually know how it works, right? And what it really means beyond the surface level. And I think studying that with, of course, a practical purpose and then tying it in to how you are going to build your own business or expand your own business, it, uh, I think that was really fascinating. So I think, you know, all the models, and of course, you get to a point where you can choose models as well. Um, as you, I think that's the first time. Uh, but they were all really interesting. And, you know, usually when you study a degree, you might find half or maybe 75% of interest in the West, you, like, you just have to do it. With this, no, I found it all interesting. And it, it didn't really feel laborious at all. It was, and I'm not being paid to say this, I just found it a lot of fun. It, and it, it, was, it was amazing. And uh, yeah, I mean, honestly, if you 
for the people listening, yeah. if you really want to like potentially become an entrepreneur and you, you just want to study it in a very structured way, do this because it will change your life if you make the most of it. Okay, so I hear from you guys, draw all that you can from your models because you can then um, package it into something that can literally um, transform your future or con you know contributes to your future career. But then one other thing I know that from my own experience in Backpack was the networks I built because there were so many interesting and diverse people and some of them are still you know my greatest friends still today you know and um I, I wanted to ask in this strange world that we live in and many of this master students are starting off online what would you say what what would you say is the benefit of the networks extracurricular and how do you suggest that we are able to carry this on you know in the strange world that we're in yeah. so should we start with you alex Sure. So my last semester at Birkbeck was online and the first uh, the first two were in person. And so I already know what it's like to study online. And, uh, you know, I think the initial perception is, oh, it's nowhere near as good and so on. But it's actually super efficient. Um, you know, I to be honest, I couldn't have done what I was doing, working and studying full time in that last semester because I was so busy with work because my startup was just launching. Um, if it wasn't online, it's super efficient. And in networking, yeah, it's really good because um, it's it, in an odd way, it's more interactive than in person. And that, that might be because some people don't want to talk, uh, you know, raise their voice in person or so on, or maybe they feel more comfortable if they don't have the camera on or whatever. But if, And I think maybe it's a comfort thing as well. You know, if you're sitting at home, maybe you're in your pajamas or something and you're listening to someone, you're listening to a lecture, you're maybe even more concentrated. So I definitely don't see it as a downside. Um, it's a great way just to, you know, to talk to people. At, and like I say, it's actually really efficient. Um, and yeah, it, it is very, obviously a very different way of uh, doing things than in person, but it's definitely nowhere near as bad as you might think. And I, to be honest, it, it, if, if I, having done it, if I was applying for a course now, it wouldn't phase me if the first semester or so was online. So can I ask a direct question? Did you yeah. meet any new friends during your last uh, semester when you were studying online? So uh -huh. I already knew everyone, so I didn't make any okay. new friends, but I definitely had more conversations um, okay. with with people about things, um, which was very interesting. And I, I think that even the we had a few guest speakers and things like that or or you know one uh, lecture was uh, by someone that it wasn't the the normal lecture and so on and uh, i think just the again the interaction i think was maybe even greater so it's def there are many pros to it actually okay thank you so much for that alex and leila what would you say about networks and extracurricular generally at backpack so I think there's already a lot that Birkbeck offers in terms of networking and extracurricular activities. And I remember personally, I regret that I didn't make more use of it <laughs> because I know I was very busy studying and then I had like a side job. And But I can really recommend try to network and meet those people. It's amazing. I remember I went to one panel together with um, some entrepreneur with a couple of entrepreneurs and it was so inspiring and great to meet them and to learn about their experience so i can really recommend um use the opportunities that are already out there and then don't be afraid um don't be afraid to ask and don't be afraid to reach out to people um of course don't just make a request on linkedin <laughs> to connect say why say what's your, your mo motivation behind it but you will find that, especially in, in, in the innovation space, a lot of people are happy to help you and are happy to give guidance. Um, and they're really there for you as a resource um, in those crazy times. And then take, don't only take the time to study, really find the areas that interest you and do your own research in addition to the modules that, are, that you are taking. And then go to the events in that regard, um, in those fields that really interest you and talk to the expert people, talk to the people who can who can speak about those areas uh, of your interest. I think that is something that um, I wish I would have done more <laughs> in, in my own student time. Thanks a lot, Leila. Actually, I think it's a good time to plug this in because Jenna did send me an email to say, can you mention that there's a career sphere going on? So um, I don't know who needs that. Um, I mean, as in, if you need that, then <laughs> grab that. That's what I meant. Um, okay, so 
time is far spent. So we're going to get to do big sister and big brother and then your final words, advice to those on the call today, on the session today. So Leila? For sentence number one, believe in yourself. I know that sometimes it can be tricky, especially in the current times, finding a job. Um, if you're not thinking about your own company, which is of, of course a great option, but if you are looking into like finding a job, don't give up. I had my own experience where I struggled for like more than half a year, finding something that really fulfilled me. But that doesn't mean that you're worthless and you have you still have the same skills then and, and be proud of yourself in that regard. And take the experience at birth back and never forget the big goal. That would be my final message. <laughs> Thank you. And Mr. Mitchell? Sure. So it's cliched, but uh, what I would say is nothing ever grows in the comfort zone. So if, if you are mm -hmm. like I was um, dissatisfied with your career or something like that, and you, you have this idea in your head, this, this thing at night, which keeps you awake like a kid on Christmas Eve with excitement, like I did, you have to go and do it and you owe it to yourself to live your best life. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, like I said, this course literally changed my life. I went from at the beginning of it, just having an idea to at the end of it, having a team of 15 people. So it like in one year, right. From largely because of what I learned in this course. So if you have an idea, if you have a, a concept in your mind that you want to make a reality, do this because if, if you don't, and you continue to be unhappy in, in your career, if, if that is why you're wanting to do this, then the only thing limiting yourself or preventing you from becoming the ultimate person you want to be is yourself, right? You need to, you need, if you want to grow and become the best version of yourself, you've got to take action. So, uh, and don't be scared because like I say, nothing grows in the comfort zone. And if you want to achieve great things, you've got to take risks. And this is a great, from my experience, is a great risk, definitely worth taking. It's not really a risk because it's so well put together, but you know, you know what I mean? It's, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Alexander, and thank you, thank you very, very much, Leila. And uh, so you heard it from the alumni. I hope that um, you will sign up to become part of the CIMR. And when you finish in Berkberg next year, I will probably be able to invite you to be one of our speakers in a future event. So we're going to move on now to the Q and A. I've seen a few questions um, on the chat, so you can still put your questions in the chat box. I have also put a form there. It's a feedback form just to help us to continue to improve this event. Um, now I'm going to hand over to um, Belina to handle the Q&A. Thank you, Doyin. So um, we have a first question for Ian and Parry. Uh, what are some innovation or entrepreneurship programs that you would recommend students to be aware of? Um, or to keep an eye, or to keep an eye on for startup opportunity. So, um, for, from my point of view, it's it's good to get a good, good well-rounded business education. So, I'd always recommend if if you could uh, attend some form of MBA to just learn the basics of strategy and business, and also to form that network. Uh, but I'll caveat that with a very important thing that I think has been very important uh, in my career. There's no substitute for actual life experience. So go and try and make an innovation happen. Get involved in something that's high risk. Do something that's entrepreneurial. If you're, um, for example, working at university, do some spin out idea that you want it to make happen. Uh, try and make innovation happen for real. And that's one of the best ways of learning how to make it happen. Yeah. Um, I'd agree with uh, Parry on that sort of, uh, I did an MBA, it sort of, it's a good grounding in a broad range of subjects out there and certainly teaches you strategy and I focus in on the marketing aspects and you wouldn't believe how useful that can be later on and it, even all these sort of years later in my role like that it's amazing just going back and you're realizing people got great ideas but you're trying to sort of say look think of this or think of that coming at it from different angles it just gives you that broad grounding uh, which will really help on that front um, Networking, as we've heard many times before, is vital out there. You never, um, you'd be amazed at how many people have got little tips and tricks or can help on all sorts of different things. So go out, collect business cards, keep in touch with them, link up with them on LinkedIn or other sort of uh, net, networking uh, websites. It, it's something that will that will stand you in good stead later on. It's amazing what happens. 
go and make those links and uh, do things like that. I'd also um, ask people to sort of link up with an organisation called the Knowledge Transfer Network as well. You can find them on uh, the internet um, rather than me try and give you the week web address because it's slightly complicated but speak to those guys um they do they run all sorts of courses as well uh, along the way and sort of briefing events and uh, have various newsletters and that so it's a good way to find out what's going off in different areas some of the key areas for technology and uh, doing different things i have join up with the knowledge transfer network as well okay thank you um so are there any other questions? No? Okay, good. So, um, well, with the No, I don't see any other questions in the in the chat. So, well, we've reached the end of this event. Then, <laughs> thank you very much. I'd like uh, to invite uh, Doyin to okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. I think we're expecting a lot more questions there. Yeah, I was expecting a lot more questions. <laughs> I guess the panel was fantastic and they've covered most of the things that our yeah. students will, um, like to ask. So I guess we'll now have the closing remarks from Helen. Thank you very much again. Sorry, Anyan. Yes, well, it's it's been a fantastic event. So thank you everybody for coming and thank you very much for the guest speakers this as we've said this isn't isn't the end of the story but it's a, another step along the way of getting um you involved in what's going on and we we hope that our guest speakers will stay in touch you know, with our activities and come and speak to us again or even take part in your own events through cimr we're always looking for interesting slots and you two will be fantastic speakers so we'll we'll keep in touch with you. We hope to keep in touch with the with the students, our current cohort. So do uh, let us know if you'd like to stay with us. Have a look at the CMIR webpage to see what activities we're doing, see what the who the other alumni are, and let us know if you want to get in touch with, us, with some of them. So that's great. So hope to see some of you tomorrow, and hope to see some of you in the events later in the term and we'll have a whole program of events in the spring term and maybe by the summer term the events will be live and we'll all be together in Bloomsbury as uh, <laughs> happy memory of seeing the yeah. video of what Beck actually looks like and seeing what people look like and but she shake hands with people so we're all looking forward to uh, this we, we've gained a lot from the COVID experience by doing things online but there's no substitute for us all being together so let's look forward to that so thank you everybody for taking part yeah. thank, you. Thank, you. thank you everyone and i live in hope and I, I do promise that if we can get together in the summer we'll probably have a networking event then okay. <laughs> so thank you thank you you can come right, to America as well and see and see, see Leila as well. Maybe she can host us at an event. One hundred percent. I'm going to host all over Birkbeck. <laughs> so Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Great evening. Bye bye. Evening. Bye. Bye. bye.